me uh, right. do this first. Let's have the I'm going to turn this like this. So I'm going to read. I'm going to read the 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 the, uh, the text. <laughs> I feel like I should be smoking a cigarette like this. <laughs> like wearing a tuxedo. Um, and uh, and then there are footnotes. And Ernie is going to be uh, the voice of the footnotes. Okay, Feel free to sing any of the lyrics. So. <laughs> I'm going to sing all the lyrics. <laughs> There's no lawyers here. <laughs> Cataract's invitation begins with the sound of trumpets, the opening of an old song called Dead Man's Party. The song plays over a dark screen for the first few seconds until the trumpets are joined by a guitar, and that's when Halliday appears. But he's not a 67-year-old man ravaged by time and illness. He looks just as he did on the cover of Time magazine back in 2014. A tall, thin, healthy man in his early 40s with unkempt hair and his trademark horn-rimmed glasses. This is what I'll be wearing in the film adaptation of the thing, uh, 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 of, the, of the project. I will also be taking hostages at the top of that tower where the Animaniacs live to make sure this <laughs> He's also wearing the same clothing he wore in the Time cover shoot, faded jeans and a vintage Space Invaders t-shirt. <laughs> Halliday is at a high school dance being held in a large gymnasium. He's surrounded by teenagers whose clothing, hairstyles, and dance moves all indicate that the time period is the late 1980s. Careful analysis of this scene reveals that all of the teenagers behind Halliday are actually extras from various John Hughes teen films who have been digitally cut and pasted into the video. <laughs> Halliday is dancing too, something no one ever saw him do in real life. Grinning maniacally, he spins in rapid circles, swinging his arms and head in time with the song, flawlessly cycling through several signature 80s dance moves. But Halliday has no dance partner. He is, as the saying goes, dancing with himself. <laughs> a few lines of text appear briefly at the lower left-hand corner of the screen, listing the name of the band, the song's title, the record label, and the year of release, as if this were an old music video airing on MTV. Boingo Boingo, Dead Man's Party, MCA Records, 1985. When the lyrics kick in, Halliday begins to lip-sync along still gyrating. All dressed up with nowhere to go, walking with a dead man over my shoulder. Oh, my voice cracked. Fucking balls. <laughs> I can't do it. Sorry. I'm coming, off, I'm, I'm coming down off of a cold. Don't run away. It's only me. <laughs> He abruptly stops dancing and makes a cutting motion with his right hand, silencing the music. At the same moment, the dancers in the gymnasium behind him vanish, and the scene around him suddenly changes. Halliday now stands at the front of a funeral parlor next to an open casket. His surroundings are actually from a scene in the 1989 film Heathers. Halliday appears to have digitally recreated the funeral parlor set and then inserted himself into it. <laughs> a second, much older Halliday, lies inside the casket, his body emaciated and ravaged by cancer. Shiny quarters cover each of his eyelids. High-resolution high scrutiny reveals that both quarters were minted in 1984. <laughs> the younger Halliday gazes down at the corpse of his older self in mock sadness, then turns to address the assembled mourners. The mourners are actually all actors and extras from the same funeral scene in Heathers. <laughs> Winona Ryder and Christian Slater are clearly visible in the audience sitting near the back. <laughs> Halliday snaps his fingers and a scroll appears in his right hand. He opens it with a flourish and it unfurls to the floor, unraveling down the aisle in front of him. It breaks, sorry, he breaks the fourth wall, addressing the viewer, and begins to read. I, James Donovan Halliday, being of sound mind and disposing memory, do hereby make, publish, and declare this instrument to be my last will and testament, hereby revoking any and all wills and codicils by me at any time heretofore made, 
He continues reading faster and faster, plowing through several more paragraphs of legalese until he's speaking so rapidly that the words are unintelligible. Then he stops abruptly. Forget it, he says. Even at that speed, it would take me a month to read the whole thing. <laughs> Sad to say, I don't have that kind of time. He drops the scroll, and it vanishes in a shower of gold dust. Let me just give you the highlights. The funeral parlor vanishes, and the scene changes once again. Halliday now stands in front of an immense bank vault door. My entire estate, including a controlling share of stock in my company, Gregarious Simulation Systems, is to be placed in escrow until such time as a single condition I have set forth in my will is met. The first individual to meet that condition will inherit my entire fortune, currently valued in excess of $240 billion. The vault door swings open and Halliday walks inside. The interior of the vault is enormous, and it contains a huge stack of gold bars, roughly the size of a large house. Here's the dough I'm putting up for grass, Halliday says, grinning broadly. What the hell? You can't take it with you, right? Halliday leans back against the stack of gold bars, and the camera pulls in tight on his face. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, what do you have to do to get your hands on all this moolah? Well, hold your horses, kids. I'm getting to that. He pauses dramatically, his expression changing to that of a child about to reveal a very big secret. Halliday snaps his fingers again and the vault disappears. In the same instant, Halliday shrinks and morphs into a small boy wearing brown corduroys and a faded The Muppet Show t-shirt. <laughs> Halliday now looks exactly as he did in a school photo taken in 1980 when he was eight years old. I was eight years old in 1980, Warner Brothers. Me too, what a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> the young Halliday stands in a cluttered living room with burnt orange carpeting, wood-paneled walls, and kitschy late 70s decor. Exactly like the living room I grew up in in Sunland when I was a kid. That's kind of weird. That's weird. <laughs> a 21-inch Zenith television sits nearby with an Atari 2600 game console hooked up to it. This was the first video game system I ever owned, Halliday says, now in a child's voice. An Atari 2600. I got it for Christmas in 1979. He plops down in front of the Atari, picks up a joystick, and begins to play. My favorite game was this one, he says, nodding at the TV screen, where a small square is traveling through a series of simple mazes. It was called Adventure. Like many early video games, Adventure was designed and programmed by just one person. But back then, Atari refused to give its programmers credit for their work, so the name of a game's creator didn't actually appear anywhere on the packaging. On the TV screen, we see Halliday use a sword to slay a red dragon, although, due to the game's crude low-resolution graphics, this looks more like a square using an arrow to stab a deformed duck. <laughs> So the guy who created Adventure, a guy named Warren Robinette, decided to hide his name inside the game itself. He hid a key in one of the game's labyrinths. If you found this key, a small pixel-sized gray dot, you could use it to enter a secret room where Robinette had hidden his name. On the TV, Halliday guides his square protagonist into the game's secret room, where the words, created by Warren Robinette, appear in the center of the screen. This. Halliday says, pointing to the screen with genuine reverence, was the very first video game Easter egg. Robinette hid it in his game's code without telling a soul, and Atari manufactured and shipped adventure all over the world without knowing about the secret room. They didn't find out about the Easter egg's existence until a few months later when kids all over the world began to discover it. I was one of those kids, and finding Robinette's Easter egg for the first time was one of the coolest video gaming experiences of my life. The young Halliday drops his joystick and stands. As he does, the living room fades away, and the, sheen, and the scene shifts again. Halliday now stands in a dim cavern, where light from unseen torches flickers off the damp walls. In the same instant, Halliday's appearance also changes once again, as he morphs into his famous oasis avatar, Anorak, a tall, robed wizard with a slightly more handsome version of the adult Halliday's face, minus the eyeglasses. Anorak is dressed in his trademark black robes, with his avatar's emblem, a large calligraphic letter A, embroidered on each screen. I almost said screen.
screen. Come on, really? Seriously, Will? Is this your first rodeo? <laughs> <laughs> Embroidered on each sleeve. Before I die, Anorak says, speaking in a much deeper voice, I created my own Easter egg and hid it somewhere inside my most popular video game, The Oasis. The first person to find my Easter egg will inherit my entire fortune. Another dramatic pause. <laughs> the egg is well hidden. I didn't just leave it lying under a rock somewhere. I suppose you could say that it's locked inside a safe that is housed in a secret room that lies hidden at the center of a maze located somewhere. He reaches up to tap his right temple. Up here. But don't worry. I've left a few clues lying around to get everyone started. And here's the first one. Anorak makes a grand gesture with his right hand and three keys appear, spinning slowly in the air in front of him. They appear to be made of copper, jade, and clear crystal. As the keys continue to spin, Anorak recites a piece of verse, and as he speaks each line, it appears briefly in flaming subtitles across the bottom of the screen. Three hidden keys open three secret gates, wherein the errant will be tested for worthy traits, and those with the skill to survive these straits will reach the end where the prize awaits. As he finishes, the jade and crystal keys vanish, leaving only the copper key, which now hangs on a chain around Anorak's neck. The camera follows Anorak as he turns and continues farther into the dark cavern. A few seconds later, he arrives at a pair of massive wooden doors set into the cavern's rocky wall. These doors are banded with steel, and there are shields and dragons carved into their surfaces. I couldn't playtest this particular game, so I worry that I may have hidden my Easter egg a little too well, made it too difficult to reach. I'm not sure. If that's the case, it's too late to do anything, it's too late to change anything now. So I guess we'll see. Anorak throws open the double doors, revealing an immense treasure room filled with piles of glittering gold coins and jewel-encrusted goblets. Analysis reveals dozens of curious items hidden amongst the mounds of treasure, most notably several early, several early home computer systems, an Apple IIe, a Commodore 64, an Atari 800XL, and a TR-80 color computer, dozens of video game controllers for a variety of game systems, and hundreds of polyhedral dice like those used in old tabletop role-playing games. <laughs> Then he steps into the open doorway and turns to face the viewer, stretching out his arms to hold open the giant double doors. A freeze frame of this scene appears nearly identical to a painting by Jeff Easley that appeared on the cover of the Dungeon Master's Guide, a Dungeon Master's rulebook published in 1983. <laughs> so without further ado, Anorak announces, let the hunt for Halliday's Easter egg begin. Then. He vanishes in a flash of light, leaving the viewer to gaze through the open doorway at the glittering mounds of treasure that lay beyond. Then, 